Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Graduation Equity Webinar Series. I'm Kathy Anderson. I'm a System Improvement and Program Supervisor Lead. And uh, today we are talking about mastery based learning. This meeting is being recorded and it should be av available uh, this week on YouTube. We have closed captions in the menu if you want to use those. And our PowerPoint is posted on our webpage. You can check that out. And we'll also be dropping it in the chat uh, as well as a resource sheet for you. This webinar is brought to you through the Office of Student Engagement and Supports within the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Uh, at OSPI, we believe each student needs to be prepared for post-secondary pathways, careers, and civic engagement. The Graduation Equity Webinar Series was created with the purpose of highlighting practices that increase access to education and ultimately to graduation. Through our webinars, we're striving to go beyond equality, to think about the opportunities that we have to examine and dismantle current policies and practices that result in disparate outcomes for our students with the ultimate goal of ensuring that each student has access to the instruction and support that will make them successful in school and in life. Um, I'd like to welcome Liz Quayle to offer our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Kathy. Family is important to our Native partners in education. Who your parents and grandparents are says much about your connection with the land and the learning and skills you bring to the community. So many of the strategies and practices in mastery-based learning, such as flexible learning, family-involved, place-based, hands-on, and experiential learning. All of these have been delivery methods for learning in our tribal lands since time immemorial. We would like to stress the importance of consulting, collaborating, and co-creating learning with your local tribes as you reflect on the process and process today's work. At this point, we encourage you to share in the chat the lands upon which you reside or work. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sharing where y'all are coming from. It's great to see so many different spaces represented from across the state. Um, some very smart colleagues of mine explained mastery-based learning to me with the example of a driver's test. Um, you can take the test as many times as you need to. Uh, you can take more time to prepare for the test as long as you need and you might have many people help you prepare. Your driver teacher lets you practice in a place where your score isn't affected or averaged into your final test. And the course is hands-on, it's relevant to the student, and it's high interest. Grading practices have the power to transform a student's relationship with learning. Um, I know from my own experience, I've failed a class before, and it is so scary and horrible. <laughs> it is a horrible experience. Um, emotionally, uh, it felt like a harsh rejection from that teacher, from the school, and like I didn't belong in the class with my brighter peers who had it together. Um, I think every student has a moment in school where they didn't do as well as they wanted to do. Um, but if it happens enough, uh, it starts to feel like it's not about the assignment, uh, but maybe it's something about me as a learner. Maybe school just isn't for me. Uh, and we want everyone to have access to that life of learning and to know uh, that that's not true. Learning's for everybody. 
I think when we reframe traditional grading into mastery-based learning, we're honoring the needs of each student. We're making learning more transparent and we're reinforcing growth mindset thinking. In place of a failing grade, it introduces the power of yet. So the student can know something or not know something yet and still know that their teacher believes in them and wants them to succeed and they have another chance. Um, and it does take rethinking by educators to make this possible. Uh, I've seen so much innovation in the last few years. And so uh, I hope folks out there uh, are interested in taking this leap. Uh, today, we chose mastery-based learning um, and we're hoping that you're walking away with some of these big objectives in mind. We want you to learn the key principles, practices, um, and also to consider some possibilities that are part of mastery-based learning. We want you to know the difference between mastery-based learning and mastery-based crediting. We want you to learn about how mastery-based learning can improve engagement and success and make uh, connections to community and culture. And um, we wanna get reflections of some practitioners who are actually doing this work out in schools and get some questions answered. I'm joined today uh, by my awesome colleague, Liz Quayle. Uh, Liz is our mastery-based learning program manager, and she's also an accountability manager here at OSPI. Uh, we also have Alyssa Muller. She is our director of Mastery-Based Learning Collaborative for the State Board of Education. And we also have with us uh, Joy Nolan. Joy is the founder and professional learning coach for New Learning Collaborative. Uh, we are so glad that y'all are with us. Um, it is going to be a great webinar. Uh, these um, ladies have amazing things to share with you today. We'd also like to know who is in our audience. So we have a poll uh, so that we can see who is here. And we want to know what is your, uh, what's your role? What grades are you working with the most? And how familiar are you with this topic? And it looks like we have quite a few school counselors, um, psychologists, community liaisons in our audience today, quite a few. We've got a good number of administrators and district office folks. We have a lot of people who are in the middle or high school range, although we do have um, a handful of folks from elementary. So we wanna make sure we speak to elementary too today. Um, and let's see, and people feel like they are somewhat familiar with this topic for the most part. Um, for some people, it's totally new. And for some people, it is um, very, very familiar. <laughs> so going in, um, I am going to just reflect these back at you so you can see them for yourself. Um, and if you didn't get to participate in the poll, don't worry, it's OK. Um, we are going to go um, to our next slide. Um, Liz, do you want to talk a little bit about what's going on in Washington? Thank you, Kathy. For the graduation equity webinars, we like to lead with data. This sample data from the 2022 Washington Report Card for Highline Public Big Picture School a mastery-based learning program shows a higher graduation rate and attendance rate than the rest of the school district. Their test scores are also higher, and they are working with a higher percentage of students with disabilities than other schools in the district. Other mastery-based learning programs have shared similar data points. However, since many are part of a comprehensive high school or a smaller program, their end numbers are too small for public reporting.
1599. Pass along to Alyssa. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. House Bill 1599 tasked the State Board of Education with leading the state's mastery based learning work group. The work group included the chairs of both the House and the Senate Education Committees, as well as representatives of all levels of our education system from superintendent to student. The work group explored barriers to mastery based learning, as well as ways to increase student access to MBL opportunities. In mastery-based learning, students advance when they master knowledge and skills tied to state learning standards, and they demonstrate mastery through meaningful, authentic assessments. Students take ownership of their learning and receive timely, differentiated support based on their needs and interests. Workgroup also developed the state's profile of a graduate, describing the cross-disciplinary skills a student needs to develop by the time they graduate from high school to be successful in their post-secondary education, careers, citizenship, and lifelong learning. The profile characteristics align with current laws around the goals for basic education and the purpose of a high school diploma. These laws already guide what students should know and be able to do by the time they graduate from high school. But the work group hopes that the profile of a graduate will really bring these laws to life and help communities understand all of the ways our education system helps develop our students as whole people beyond just their academic knowledge. The development of the profile of a graduate skills is a lifelong process, but the K-12 system its focus is to support every student in developing age appropriate foundational skills we want to see in each graduate of our K-12 system. As a result of the published work group report, in 2020, the legislature approved an innovative learning pilot program or ILPP, where programs received credit waivers from the State Board of Education and prototypical funding for the days students are off-site for internships. The origin of this interest was to place a macro lens on broad competencies. Our OSBE, OSPI, and SBE, State Board of Education team, met with the ILPP schools for monthly meetings throughout the 2021 to 2022 school year, interviewing their representatives on practices, successes, and challenges. This culminated in a legislative report we published from which we are now working to establish rules and guidance for internship funding. While many of the schools in the ILPP follow big picture learning methods, this is by no means the only way to provide mastery based learning. The State Board of Education leads the Mastery Based Learning Collaborative, or MBLC. The MBLC provides professional learning to educators and supports schools in implementing mastery-based learning and culturally responsive sustaining education. The aim of CRSE is to elevate historically marginalized voices and to affirm racial, cultural, and linguistic identities. School grant awardees participate in the collaborative to share a practice effective practices for implementing mastery-based learning. Just as Liz said, there's multiple ways to provide mastery-based learning in our state, multiple different models. So the collaborative is focused on elevating best practices out of all of these. The project's overarching goal is to inform future policy by helping decision makers better understand what quality mastery-based learning looks like, how long it takes to implement, and what resources are necessary. The MBLC is focused on being a community, not just a grant project, but a true community where we all work toward commonly defined goals around culturally responsive, sustaining mastery-based learning and problem solve together when issues arise. 
We do have a Friends of the MBLC interest group for folks interested in staying connected to the work. The competencies used by some of our mastery-based learning programs come from big picture learning. And as mentioned before, by both myself and Anissa, Alyssa, this is mastery-based learning. Competencies encompass general life skills students need for their life beyond high school. These competencies connect to state standards through broad topics that often address more than one content area. Communication includes ELA, research skills, instructional technology. Quantitative reasoning includes math skills and may also incorporate art and social studies. Empirical reasoning is similar to science and includes design work and research. Social reasoning includes diverse perspectives, culture, systems, and geography. Personal qualities focuses on personal health, fitness, a productive learning mindset, and expands to include community engagement. The competencies used by some of our mastery-based learning programs Oh, sorry. Um, these competencies have strong connections with the State Board of Education's profile of a graduate, with some overlapping to link to multiple qualities and skills. Personally, I saw connections between the two sets of outcomes and drew them here. The legislature defined mastery-based learning in 2019 when it created the work group. And the work group reaffirmed that definition because it's the definition widely acknowledged in the field of mastery-based learning across the nation and the world. This is the definition that we use across the state of Washington and specifically that our MBLC schools are using for their work. The definition on this slide is the same as the one articulated in statute, but it's simply a plain talked version to be more accessible to the families and communities that we serve. In MBL, students help direct their own learning and move forward at their own pace. Students demonstrate mastery of skills or concepts through tests, portfolios, projects, or other demonstrations. Assessments are aligned to learning standards and allow students to show what they know, as well as provide valuable feedback on the areas in which students need to deepen their learning. Students receive help based on their individual interests and needs, and mastery-based learning honors the unique contributions of every student and the knowledge they bring from their diverse cultures and communities. Students are empowered to make interdisciplinary connections and can use their learning in many ways. Learning is relevant and engaging for students and can be applied outside of the classroom. I also want to acknowledge that a lot of these components are just good teaching methods. So some teachers may be doing bits and pieces of these already, but the shift comes when the full school building embarks on this change process so that students know what to expect and are supported in all of these ways in every classroom in a school building. That's the big difference between mastery-based learning and mastery-based crediting. In MBL, it's the entire school building versus in mastery-based crediting, which is an approach used in schools to award credit to individual students based on their prior knowledge or other demonstration of mastery of learning standards. Many traditional schools offer mastery-based crediting opportunities, but very few schools have fully implemented mastery-based learning in our state. As a reminder, State Board of Education has rules on mastery-based crediting, which are linked on the next slide that Liz will talk about. Thank you. Mastery-based learning or crediting is often referred to as competency or performance-based. In fact, many of our school districts 
older existing policies may say competency-based credit for the current WASDA or Washington State School Direct District Directors Associations recommended policies for mastery-based credits. It's all the same thing. The focus is that the student's learning or completion of a concept is successful and not graded or assessed before the student has demonstrated competency or mastery of the learning targets. Standards-based grading illustrates this with its levels of not meeting the standards through exceeding standards as defined for the course or assignment. This removes behavior or attendance factors from grades. Mastery-based crediting focuses on the completion of that credit or course. Mastery-based learning focuses on instructional practices, which is already taking place in many of our classrooms and schools. This includes using clear student-friendly learning outcomes a hands-on or experiential approach to learning through local civic and environmental concerns and project-based learning, offering timely feedback as students work to master outcomes, giving students multiple chances to demonstrate mastery, working together with students to develop and use scoring criteria to self-assess, including community and cultural connections, this all supports students and teachers in developing the knowledge, skills, and vision to make meaningful change in how learning happens. Through this graphic, I've color-coded the topics within each sample competency. At this point, I will share a unit I used with my students in a combined English marine biology class, which also gave students activities to support other subject areas in their learning plan. We did not complete every item in this demonstration, but plans were there for expansion. This example was a unit on oxygen levels in the Hood Canal. This fjord, not canal, it was not human made, has an underwater berm at its entrance, which inhibits active water flow during tidal changes. Non-point pollution added, adds to the concerns about the decreased oxygen levels. Starting with the sciences, we visited the local marine science center to learn about measuring oxygen levels and the marine life in it. We were able to study statistics of the oxygen levels and water flow and use geometry for distance measurement. Students chose activities to process their learning, including making models of the geology of the basin and selected literature options that focus on marine and maritime life from poetry to novels. They looked at government agency oversight and local historical impacts on the waterway and learned about the industries that both rely on Hood Canal and provide some of the pollution sources. Students learned about treaties and fishing rights and practices of the Skokomish who live and fish in the southern waters, looking at their livelihood and the oxygen depletion that results from some of their traditional practices, discussing how they would present their findings to the tribal council, creating an awareness of local coastal Salishan languages and tribal culture. Students developed argument points and prepared debate of pollution point positions using multimedia. They also looked at how the health of the canal affects them personally. From water quality to water sports, they discussed how they could be active 
in promoting or cleaning the fjord, participating in volunteering, advocacy, internships, and future studies such as marine biology, ecosystems, environmental sciences, and career options in the fishing industry or government. This is a sample of multiple activities that can develop from one local concern with activities driven by student interest and infused with state standards. There are many ways in which mastery-based learning provides implication for equity in education. The learning is student-led, meaning that the students' interests and real-life applications for their learning are inherent in the projects they pursue. The local community is brought in to enhance and make relevant and enhancing the learning through involving community resources and making connections. This not only shows the students what is available in their community for post high school engagement, it also demonstrates to the community the quality of education that is provided in local schools. Content across subject areas is blended just as in the adult world. We don't live in separate subject areas and mastery based learning shows the connections between content areas. Culturally connected learning celebrates and builds upon their family and heritage through projects that are meaningful to each student, incorporating learning styles that are embedded in the fabric of the student's culture and its history. At this point, we would like to share a couple of videos reflecting student and staff experiences in mastery-based learning. Ritual is a ninth grader at Innovation High School in Bothell. Let's listen to why she likes this style of learning. Definitely, it's definitely a step up from a normal high school because considering like their, their motto is students are take guide of their own learning. And I really enjoyed the way my teachers teach me because I feel like they actually care about my education rather than just going up there talking about the material and handing out an assignment. My teachers are actually like paying attention to what I'm doing, making sure I'm getting everything that I need. And I feel like that's definitely something that every student needs. And it's definitely nice to have that here at the school. Nobody tells you this is what you need to do, but you need to make the choice to do it for your own well-being. So here, I feel like it's not an easy school. They teach you the same amount of stuff they would teach you at a normal school. But then here, adding on to that, they give you projects and they let you explore about what you want to do rather than what the teachers want you to do. I feel like I want to do this rather than I have to do this. Like when I went to my middle school, I felt like I was being dragged to school to like learn. But here I feel like I want to come here every day because it's like I love learning here. I love the way that my teachers teach me. I love like the whole system. And so even I feel like uh, I feel smart because I'm getting so much knowledge and I'm able to use it in like projects and assignments and I'm doing great. Definitely. The State Board of Education in studying mastery-based learning chose to interview several staff members and students involved in the mastery-based learning collaborative with a focus on Avanti High School in Olympia. Images include learning activities in under other MBLC schools, including Maritime High School in Highline School District and Elma, Elma Elementary in Elma School District. This video is also featured on the State Board of Education's Mastery-Based Learning website.
so it was my first year here and it was automatically a better experience because it takes away a lot of that stress. It gives an opportunity for students to learn at the pace that they need to learn. It gives them an opportunity to dive deep. It gives them an opportunity to demonstrate what they know in ways that are different. It really lets me um, connect to what I'm learning and it lets me choose how I learn and what I learn. It's an opportunity to individualize and center the student rather than centering the teacher. To decenter the teacher is magical because then the student is much more excited about what they're learning. They're much more interested in what they're learning because they're owning it. Mastery-based learning kind of liberates me to honor the actual learning that students are doing rather than checking boxes. For the sake of checking boxes, it feels meaningful. In a traditional model, oftentimes what you have is one set of tests, one set of curriculum, one approach. And we know that you know, kids just don't learn like that. People uh, can learn in whatever way feels good to them and whatever way is safe for them. It's just more personal. Not only are you taking in the information that you need, but you're also comfortable to do so because you have such a personal relationship with the teachers and they make sure they know who you are, what your learning style is, and what works best for you in the classroom. The ability for a student to be able to articulate and communicate what it is that they've learned is central. I think I know when I've mastered a lesson, when I can take whatever formula I've learned in the class and apply it to other skills. I can tell when I've mastered a lesson when I can teach someone else about it. Because it's not going to be something written on a piece of paper necessarily. It's not going to be something that's turned in with a bubble sheet. It's going to be something that they're going to actually be able to explain to you. And through that, it's very clear what they have learned and what they haven't learned. Having students show us what they know through their own strengths and interests is really powerful for both the, the learner and, and for the educators. Okay, at this point, I think we want to introduce our keynote presenter. We are so lucky to have Joy Nolan as a professional learning coach supporting Washington State's MBLC schools with learner-centered shifts in academics and school culture. Previously, Joy worked for NYC Public Schools as co-founder and longtime director of the Competency Collaborative an active community of 90 plus public K-12 schools. Member schools in both the MBLC and the CC are using competency mastery-based and culturally responsive sustaining education practices with educational equity as a guiding value. These schools seek to make school a place of belonging, discovery, and growth for each learner. I am so excited for you to hear from my friend and mentor in this work, Joy Nolan. Oh, Alyssa, thank you so much. Um, I'm so honored to be here. I see we have almost 300 people gathered here today, um, taking time from all the other busy things that pull on us all the time um, to learn about and think about how to make school work better for our young people. I'm very honored to be here with some of the um, member schools in the Mastery Based Learning Collaborative. Um, I'm really honored to be working in partnership with the State Board of Education and with um, Great Schools Partnership, um, my colleagues in coaching and providing professional learning for this visionary group of schools. Um, an honor to be here with many educators across Washington State as well. 
So just a little um, refresher perhaps on what this group of schools is. Um, the MBLC or Mastery Based Learning Collaborative is a community, not just a group, but an active community learning with one another and from one another across the state of Washington. And they are choosing to focus on, learn about, build systems for mastery based learning, which is also called competency based learning. Those are basically synonyms, more or less. We could talk for an hour just about that, but for our purposes today, let's just say competency-based and mastery-based are roughly synonyms. Um, anyway, using this MBL or mastery-based learning um, together with culturally responsive and sustaining education practices, e equity is the guiding value of this project. And you all know that the MBLC is a project of Washington State Board of Education. Um, and my colleague and friend, Alyssa, is the director. You see here a picture from one of our founding member schools, Quincy Innovation Academy. Um, and the educator leaning over and talking with a student about a text is none other than Principal Colleen Frakes, who will be on a panel with you all in a little while. Here is um, a snapshot of the logos of all of the cohort one schools in the Mastery Based Learning Collaborative, schools that are learning with and from one another all across the state of Washington. And it's going great so far. We are early in, we're about halfway through our first full school year. Um, there was some planning time that happened last spring. Right now we're immersed in our first of two full school years, learning about and implementing some of these shifts. You will see schools here that span K to 12. You'll see CTE schools, choice schools, large comprehensive high schools, lots of middle schools, so we really see this model working really well for many kinds of schools and many kinds of students. Together, we are seeking to make school more clear, fair, and equitable for young people who spend their whole day with us, uh, Monday through Friday for several years. Um, the schools each have a team that leads work in their school um, as part of an active sharing network across the state and in partnership with youth advisors in their buildings who help the adults understand what actually is an improvement and how to actually be centered around what learners need. Um, each school also gets support from professional learning coaches, um, me and several colleagues at Great Schools Partnership. And together, we as a community are working on accurate and equitable grading, supporting students to become independent, more expert learners who not just learn math, science, ELA, social studies, phys ed, art, and various electives, but really learn how to learn. And I hope that you'll be hearing from students' voices um, uh, you heard from Ratul and a few other students. Um, there will be another video that offers student voice about this. Um, I find it much more meaningful coming from the mouth of a student than the mouth of an adult. So that's just my preference. Um, we really are relying on research-based practices about what benefits students, both as people and as learners. We really want to think of our students not just as, you know, a beast in math or a struggling learner or a vulnerable student or a gifted student or an A student, all those labels um, limit what we have before us, which is a full-fledged holistic person. Um, we want to value each student and their multiple identities. And we want to work together on a healthy and responsive school culture. So the goals that we have, each school has set um, 
two years worth of goals in various topics. But what we are um, joined together on is building, yes, subject area learning, subject area expertise, but also a set of skills that students can use across all of their classes and beyond school on their soccer team. Um, you know, if there's a family illness, maybe they can use some of those skills to help support their family through that. Um, these are skills that students say are very useful to them in college. And so building this set of skills that last things that students will still be using 10 years after high school, 20 years after middle school. Um, and, and we also seek to make school a place of belonging, discovery, both personal discovery and academic discovery, personal growth and academic growth. And we really want every single student to feel and assume and experience that their school is for them and other kids like them, however they would define that in every way possible. So we're working on a lot of different things. So we said educational equity is our guiding value. Um, we really love the PESB's definition of equity, developing, strengthening, and supporting procedural and outcome fairness in systems, procedures, and resource distribution mechanisms to create equitable opportunities for all individuals. The term also includes eliminating barriers that prevent the full participation of individuals and groups. We thank PESB for this wonderful definition of educational equity. And I ask everyone to please be thinking about what does it mean for educational equity to be a guiding value? For us, it means every single thing that we're doing, um, this is the light by which we see, this is our purpose. Um, we, we think about um, whether a certain practice or a certain message or a certain way of thinking about school or a certain shift that a school is planning to make is meeting and reaching toward the promise of equity as a guiding value. Um, so we also want to ask you to think and reflect upon what does reaching for equity look like and not look like in schools? And what is your particular role from your sphere of influence in learning about equity work and supporting equity work? So we're here to talk today about mastery-based learning, yes, but also culturally responsive and sustaining education practices. These two approaches that really dovetail and, and sort of amplify one another's power. They are two separate sets of research and practice that support academic success for learners with equity as a guiding value. So we're going to play, hope I don't play it prematurely. <laughs> I'm not the best DJ at PowerPoint, but here is a video called What is Mastery-Based Learning? We've heard some great things from Liz and great things from Alyssa and Kifi as well. Let's hear it from the student and the teacher point of view. What is mastery-based learning? Just a real quick set up for this video. This is Omar. He joined his physics class a month late, um, feeling a little intimidated. And this video outlines his experience working with his teacher to get up to speed with where the rest of the class is from. His voice is a little bit quiet at the beginning of the video, which is why I'm sharing this set up with you. He'll tell you right away that he joined the physics class a month late and take the story from there. In the beginning of the year, I joined the, the physics class like a month after the school year started. I was completely lost. 
There's those students who they've gotten one failing grade after the next. They are struggling. Physics is usually a hard subject for a lot of students, and they shut down. If you get enough failing grades, eventually students start avoiding that failure. In the regular grading system, it'll just say like missing homework here, missing homework there. That's not really telling you what specifically you need to improve on. Mastery-based grading is a way that the teacher identifies which standards you need to successfully master that topic. By breaking down all my assessments on skills, the students get feedback on how they're doing on an individual skill that they can then use to identify their strengths and weaknesses. Each part is graded on a scale of zero to four, with four being Absolute Einstein, you got it, and zero means that you don't got it yet. What it meant to my classroom was, as the expert in this content, you know, what are the skills and the knowledge that the students should know by the end of the unit or by the end of the year? And that makes everything, like, you know, your goal is clear for you as a teacher. I started aligning the stuff that I already had for my curriculum with the competencies that I spent a lot of time setting. The structure is now more student-based learning. Because of the master-based grading, the teacher can accurately see what the class as a whole what they're not good at, so they can make their lesson plan around what they don't know. Omer was kind of unique. Mastery-based grading allowed me to, instead of giving him this packet of a huge number of assignments, like, all right, you missed this, you missed this, there were 10 homeworks, and that can be very overwhelming. I was able to give him a list of, these are the five skills that we need to demonstrate before you can be on track with the rest of the class. It breaks it down into specific parts. It tells you where you're doing good and where you're doing bad, so you could know what you need improvement on. It's encouraged me to go go into my other classes with the same, the same mindset and want to try my best on, on the work. At the end of every marking period, when I see that passing grade on my report card, that's when I, I feel successful. My biggest goal as far as what I want students to get out of this is that they can make progress. That if you try, if you keep on working at it, if you keep on taking advantage of these opportunities, that there is no reason why any student in my classroom can't be successful. I want to achieve. I want to get high grades. And this is a great way to map out exactly how to get there. I feel proud of myself because I didn't just give up with the the low grade I got, I improved on it. It made me realize that that's all it takes to be successful, just never give up. So before moving ahead, I just wanna echo what Omar said at the end there. You know, he learned not just physics, but he learned how to learn. And it was really compelling to him. And he feels like he can take the strategies he learned in his physics class with his amazing teacher, Liz Dowdell, and move that um, to his other classes. Um, that particular video was taken in a school where the MBL practices were only in a few classrooms. Um, and then it spread to the whole school, which is one of the ways in which this can grow from individual teachers realizing that they want to make changes to do right by their students in these ways. And then it can spread to the whole school. Um, so here are some principles and practices of competency-based or mastery-based learning. Um, and some of these will be familiar. Um, some of them have been shared and pointed out a bit already. I bet folks on our panel later will be illuminating some aspects of these things, but um, learners are at the center. Um, maybe every school believes that learners are at the center, but what we mean is if there's a practice that's happening in the school that isn't maximizing benefit to learners, let's think about it and maybe think about redesigning it and innovating and piloting a new twist or a new way to do something, a new approach to make sure that we are in line with the research on learning, what the learners themselves are saying they want and need, and making sure that we're not just doing the same thing we did last month or last year or 10 years before these students were born, um, but that we're being responsive to our young people. Um, the next slide on the right, the next box there, 
clear, meaningful learning outcomes are the through line for all teaching and learning. That's one of the very, very big important things about MBL or competency-based learning. Um, you set out what are the learning goals. The students understand the criteria for those things right from the start. They know what they're going for right from the start. So they're not just doing worksheet six. They're not just making a big, wonderful, fun project because it's big and wonderful and fun. They're actually doing it as a way to build their muscles and build their skills and build their concepts and their subject expertise and sometimes interdisciplinary learning um, based on clear learning outcomes that are sort of the compass and the through line for everything that's happening in teaching and learning. The next one is very related, transparency. We want to make sure that the goal, the purpose, the finish line, the whole thing is clear and equally clear to everyone. So we're not just printing out a bunch of language that students might or might not understand and plopping it on their desk. We're actually unpacking the criteria. You know, what does it mean when we say we need sufficient evidence and reasoning to support your claim. Let's look at that and unpack it and talk about it because I bet you lots of your students, that language just sort of glazes over them. So let's make sure that the path to success is open and clear to everyone. And there's not a sort of like secret way that students do well in school that other students don't have access to. Um, jumping down to the second row, responsive piecing and supports. So some folks say learning is the constant and pacing is the variable, whereas in a traditional school, maybe that's reversed, right? We finished unit four on Thursday, the unit four test is on Friday, and on Monday, kind of no matter what happened, we're moving on to unit five. And there's no plan to circle back and get all those pieces that, you know, let's say you got a 70 on the unit assessment for unit four. On Monday, we begin unit five and you didn't get 30% of what there was to get. And yet we're moving on because it's time for unit five. So we switch that around and make sure that students feel ready for assessments, that they're getting timely feedback and support along the way as they learn. Um, and of course, when we're learning skills and developing independent mastery, we want to make sure that students have active and hands-on co-generative learning, meaning maybe collaborating with the teacher on how that skill or how that um, concept is being learned. Is it working for the students? I sometimes think about if you were teaching a class to ride a bicycle, you would not want to start with a diagram of a bicycle and having students memorize all the parts of a bicycle and then take a quiz. You'd want to wheel some bicycles into the classroom, ask students to touch them, talk about them, say what they notice. And probably by the time that class period was over, a student might be riding a bike down the hall if that had been cleared with the safety officers for that to happen that day in that hallway. So it's really important that we do hands-on learning and um, learning science shows us that when we use our hands and we apply our skills and we talk about and process what we're learning, it becomes more sticky. That's a term from Zaretta Hammond, um, sticky learning. We want to have assessment that supports learning, right? So learners don't have that walking the plank feeling. You know, the big test is on Thursday. I didn't get much sleep the night before because my little brother was sick and crying or I have had a job and I wasn't able to cram. Um, I was working at the deli and I don't know how I'm going to do on this test. And it's my one shot. It's 40% of my grade. And, and I'm too stressed out to show the very best that I could do that day. Um, we try to get rid of that stress, making sure that we're designing and planning for multiple at bats. Also, because it's important for students to be able to show what they know and can do in multiple contexts over time. And then finally, grading for equity, accuracy, and well being. Um, perhaps you all know, but the original purpose of grades in public education was to sort and rank students um, basically demographically into different futures. So, grading has um, some real wonderful uses and some sort of loaded stuff too. 
Um, grades are both a message to the learner about where they are in their learning right now. Um, and then there are also credentials that we give our students as they leave in the form of a transcript. We have to be thinking about how to handle both those super important um, purposes for grades. So these are the kinds of conversations that we have. So here are some power shifts. I, uh, this is a lot of text on here and a lot of concepts. So let's just look at the first one. Um, I just want to say we find it useful to think about not just what it is that we are trying to move toward, but what, what are we trying to move or evolve past? So here are some examples of a more traditional approach to education um, and then a way that we're shifting power to our young people um, by using an MBL approach. So let's just look at the very first one. Um, in a traditional classroom, the teacher knows the learning goal and the criteria, but might or might not be sharing those with those students as they're learning. That might come in the form of a rubric, you know, three days before a project is due or somewhere along the line. Um, whereas in an MBL classroom, learning goals are shared from the start. They stay constant over the course of a year. So students have multiple opportunities over time to revisit and understand better and build expertise and capacity. Um, the learning outcomes have explicit, measurable, transferable skills and knowledge um, that supports student agency. And honestly, they're written in the language that students can really understand and most often begin with the words, I can. So instead of students will be able to, we are using the language, I can, handing it right to the students. Just one, one of the many power shifts of um, becoming more powerful educators by putting more power in the hands of our young people. Um, hope, hoping that y'all will download the slide deck and think about how each of these different shifts um, puts more power in the hands of our learners. So now I want to think a little bit with you about the culturally responsive and sustaining education piece of this, CRSE, another acronym. Um, the, three, the three pillars of CRSE are student learning, cultural competence, and critical consciousness. Um, you'll notice that the main point of this approach, like the main point of mastery-based learning, is student learning, right? That comes first. Um, this, this was based on the research of Dr. Gloria Ladson-Billings, who named these three pillars in the 90s. Um, all students can and must experience academic success. And she's talking about all the wonderful subject knowledge that students get, but also a focus on love of learning and on what's important to the learner. Um, and we believe that MBL is a really strong support for this pillar one of CRSE. Then we have cultural competence, basically means that we as educators work with our students so that they as well understand our own identities, our own multiple and intersecting identities, I understand I'm an older white woman. If I show up in a classroom, people will think one or two or other things about me. My age and my um, race and my um, hetero appearance and cisgender appearance, all of these things are factors in my presence. They affect the lens that I see the world with. And the point of cultural competence is to understand our own identities, the lens that we have, the experiences that we've had in the world, but then really how can we understand others who are not like ourselves and work effectively with others who are not like ourselves. And finally, Dr. Ladson Billings asked for us to support students in developing their critical consciousness or socio-political consciousness. So studying systems, 
studying the use of power, um, thinking about justice and injustice, and addressing real world problems could be in your school, could be in your community, it could be in the wider world. Um, but just making sure that you have a lens and, and that students have the agency to see themselves as change makers. So it is said that all schools are culturally responsive and sustaining. Perhaps that's surprising to hear. We need to think about whose culture we are being most responsive and sustaining to and why that might be. We have to think about what is the impact on students' experience of school if they are or are not being responded to, seen, valued, sustained. And then also what is the impact on the quality of students' education. So these aren't just idle questions or abstract questions. These really get at the heart of a young person's feeling that the school is for them. Um, these are some of the principles and practices involved with CRSE. Um, the ones in the dark green boxes are excerpted from New York State's um, education department's culturally responsive and sustaining education framework. It names developing students' ability to connect across lines of difference, so that's cultural competence, empowering students as agents of social change, critical consciousness, preparing students for rigor and independent learning, that's student learning, pillar one, elevating historically marginalized voices, creating student-centered learning environments that affirm various identities. Um, the ones in the lighter boxes are questions and aspects of practice that I filled in to sort of help you understand and get a picture of what this work can look like in a school. And I think that you'll be seeing some real similarities and distinctions between mastery-based learning and culturally responsive and sustaining education. They, um, they both have similar intentions and they have distinctions about them too. So here we are back at this slide, culturally responsive and sustaining education and MBL to learner-centered practices and sets of research that support academic success as their first and primary goal. But we wanna think about who are the learners that we are putting at the center? Who is that little boy working in the middle of this slide? How are we getting to know him, his community, his family? If we're putting him at the center, how much are we asking for his voice and his input? How much does he get to say and decide and give feedback and input and co-create? what his day at school looks like. So I want to share what we discovered in New York City in the Competency Collaborative, which I always say is the sister city to the MBLC. Um, we started 10 years ago with 28 schools that wanted to do this work, much like this cohort of 20 some odd schools in Washington. We started out though, only working on mastery-based learning. Um, we knew that MBL um, arose and developed from an intention to be responsive and equitable in working with students as learners. So what really works for kids when they set about learning? A really wonderful and much needed intention. Then we started to wonder and hear from our schools, hmm, how can schools and teachers get to know and value and incorporate the actual students before them um, I can share a brief experience. I, when I first moved to New York, I was an adjunct teaching at um, Parsons School of Design, and I had an eight o'clock in the morning comp class. I had a lot of Korean students. I had been previously teaching in a different part of the country 
um, and had a rapport with my students and believed in active learning and would over and over again try to engage my students in conversation and got a lot of silence. And if, so, if I had been more culturally competent, I would have understood that the culture and perhaps the eight o'clock hour of the students in my class at Parsons at eight o'clock in the morning, um, it wasn't going to work for me to ask for like a freewheeling open conversation in that class, it didn't work very well. And it took me a while to figure that one out. So there's a piece of cultural competence and an example. So how can we get to know those students that we're putting at the center? For some reason I don't, my, my uh, slide is not advancing to the next little box just not happening. Kefi, I'm not sure if you're able to drive. Whoops. Um, whoops. Anyhow, um, I guess we can go back. I'm just going to go back to basically um, in New York. We're putting our um Joy, you are cutting out. Are you still there? <laughs> we might have lost Joy. <laughs> okay, there's Joy. She's back again. So sorry. That's never happened to me before. Thank you for your patience. So and, and long story short, educators told us they need guidance. You know, if we're putting our young people at the center, New York City has a very, very diverse student body um, and a, a diverse um, educator force as well. Although there are many more um, white female teachers. Um, doesn't really match up demographically with our students. And so we really needed a way for our students and our teachers to get to know one another. And fundamentally, this is culturally responsive and sustaining education. And I can't advance slides anymore. So if whoever can, can switch to the next. Here we go. Okay. So on, um, sorry, it's, it's a little wonky, but we'll get through it. Um, this is, I want to go back one. Please forgive. Here we go. Okay. So there is a really great guide to culturally responsive indicators and practice. Um, some folks think that um, culturally responsive um, practice is simply making sure that students have a lot of voice and choice, but it's a pretty um, wide ranging um, and specific number of pedagogical and curriculum moves. So I just wanna share this um, indicator document with you. Um, when you have the slides, you'll have the link to this. indicators of the three pillars. And then here are some ways that both CRSE and MBL work together and some distinctions from them. I'm sorry that the slides keep jumping around. Um, so what is possible when we put these things together? Um, the benefits that we have seen are independent proficiencies um, for our learners. I really don't understand why the slides are jumping around like crazy. Here we go. Okay. Power shifts and role shifts. So our students develop agency. Um, 
they are responsible for their own learning. They know that it's them who needs to show independent um, demonstration of proficiency. Um, the teachers are acting as designers and coaches rather than like the head of the orchestra or the director from the front. Um, the students have meaningful input along the way. They get significant support from their teachers as coaches and there is a sense of belonging and positive learning identity. So we're sustaining our learners multiple intersecting identities, building a sense of belonging and agency, and most importantly, perhaps, to get back to that first most important goal of CRSE and of MBL, we're fostering students' sense of themselves as capable learners and giving them the skills of expert capable learners. Um, I know that we want to leave room for the panel and we've had a little bit of jumping around. So I'll just share that here is um, an interview with some alums from a mastery based high school um, who say that they think more like the professor than like the other students in their high school. And hope that hope that you will um, check that out if that seems interesting to you. There is a video here from an alum from one of our schools who basically says the same thing. She explains that when she gets a college assignment, she sort of breaks it down into like, what are the skills I need to demonstrate? All the other students come running up to her and asking her for her help and how does she know what she's doing? And she says, it's because I went to a MBL school and they gave me these skills that I'm still using right now. Um, it's a very charming interview, but I want to make sure that we have room and space for our panel. So we'll skip that for today, but do go back and give it a look if you can. Thank you for your time. Sorry for all of the technical difficulties. Thank you, Joy Nolan and everybody, if you could please uh, give her some love. Um, we have reaction buttons available. I think we should give Joy a big round of applause and thank you, Joy, so much for sharing um, this awesome information. I think like mastery-based learning is such a great topic and just thinking about how do we live into the values of equity and um, just educational justice. So thank you so much for coming today and for hanging out with us. Um, as Joy said, there are, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about resources, so stick around and um, we're going to talk a little bit about our panel as well. Um, before we move on, I just want to check with uh, Jocelyn really quick. Are there uh, questions in the Q&A that needed to be resolved? Not at the moment. All of our questions have been answered in the Q&A, but as you all have any questions for our panels, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A and we can do our best to address them. Perfect, thank you, Jocelyn. Okay, um, we are gonna move on to our panel group and talk about what does it look like to do this in school? Uh, so uh, Liz, did you wanna introduce our panel today? Um, we are pleased to be able to introduce representatives from three of our innovative learning pilot programs, some of whom are also involved in the Mastery Based Learning Collaborative. We welcome Julia Bamba, Principal at Gibson Eck High School in Issaquah, Sarah Mouncy, Principal of the Independent Learning Center in the Matau Valley, and Colleen Frakes, Whole Child Director and Principal of the Quincy Innovation Academy in Quincy. Thank you for being here today. All right. Um, so to begin with, I think it would be helpful to get a little bit of background information um, from our panelists. So um, we're gonna start off with Colleen. Colleen, do you wanna talk a little bit about your situation? Thank you. Yes, it's wonderful to be here with you all. Um, our school, Quincy Innovation Academy, is a K-12 school. We have several programs in our school, and one of those programs is uh, the one that we're doing with the Mastery Based Learning Collaborative. That program serves students in 6th through 12th grade. We have two 
two classrooms. We're very small. Um, uh, we have a middle school grade band group and a high school grade band group. And we're working under the big picture model that was described earlier. So our students are working towards um, the areas of competency that Liz described earlier with an independent learning plan. And we're working really hard to um, get our students out in the community, working in internships in an area of passion, and then connecting that learning that they're doing out in those internships and their, their um, personalized learning plan and helping them to not only be seeing those clear outcomes for each of those competencies, um, but also making sure that they're, they are um, covering the state standards that they need to be learning and progressing in and making sure that we're including those uh, very intentionally and carefully as they're working through their um, learning plans. So that's a little bit about uh, Quincy Innovation Academy. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, let's go to Julia. Okay, thank you, Peppy. I'm Julia Bamba, the principal of Gibson Eck High School, and Gibson Eck High School is located in Issaquah, Washington. We opened in 2016, so we're in our seventh year. Uh, we are part of the Big Picture Learning Network, and we are also um, part of the uh, Mastery Consortium. So we use a Mastery Transcript, for, and we're one of the first sending schools um, as part of that group. We have 185 students, grades 9 through 10, and um, we kind of think about ourselves as um, competency-based, project-based, and real-world real world learning. So our students are out at internships on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, and yeah, I think that's a good overview. Thanks. Awesome, and let's go to Sarah. Hi, thank you, Kefi. Uh, my name is Sarah Mounsey. I'm the principal of the Met Howe Valley Independent Learning Center in TWISP. Um, like Colleen and Julia described, we are a big picture learning school. Uh, formerly, the Met Howe Valley ILC was an alternative school uh, with a packet-based curriculum using ALE funding uh, where students would drop in, um, take quizzes on multiple choice packets, um, and show their learning in those ways. Uh, we transitioned to adopt big picture learning practices in 2013, um, so have been growing and changing and refining our practices ever since then, um, oftentimes largely informed by what our, our partners and other big picture schools do. So I get, I get to learn from both Colleen and Julia which is, um, I'm, an, I'm honored to be able to do that. And Sarah, um, from what I've heard, you have actually been a teacher who is doing this work in the classroom as well. How did you get confident in your ability to teach this way? I mean, I assume you don't just like wake up and know how to do it. Um, did you start all in? Was your school all in? What were the supports that helped you when you got stuck? Great question. Thank you. Um, we transitioned to adopt big picture learning after visiting Highline Big Picture and observing what truly student led learning looked like in practice. Um, and we were all in right away. Um, we didn't really take any time. We started adopting some of those practices the day we returned from our visit because we were so excited by what we saw there. Um, and I will say that it's it's a learning curve. Um, you know, I think working in a mastery-based school or, or the way that we we practice mastery-based practices, um, it requires a certain amount of comfort with chaos because if we really are to shift the power from adult to student, then we need to be very mindful of um, allowing the student and empowering the student to drive the learning. Um, and so there's, there's a long road to, to unlearning some of the things that those of us who've been in traditional schools learned um, and a release of power that um, it's, it's an absolutely incredible once we see it in practice, um, when students really take a hold of their learning and gain the confidence that is needed to, to push themselves to become, to learn to be accountable to themselves. Um, and so how do I get through or how have I in the past gotten through those challenges? It's really leaning on others who are doing similar work. Um, that's why different opportunities to work in communities of practices are so essential to this work, I think. Yeah, it definitely helps to have someone you can call. I know <laughs> from my own experience as a teacher, it always, you know, it's nice to be able to go down the hall and talk to somebody. Um, Colleen, I'm wondering from like a leadership perspective, 
how do you manage the planning to do this well? I know like when I, when you're setting up your unit plans, I assume it's a little bit different. Are there shortcuts to it? Um, how has the use of time changed? Yeah, so from a leadership perspective and in, in, um, helping a school get going with these kinds of practices, the, the big word that comes up is collaboration and having to really work collaboratively, not just the staff at the school working collaboratively, but but the teachers understanding and, and really embracing that shift to truly collaborating with that student. And, and then even beyond that, the students and the families, beyond that, the students and our community members who are helping us to provide great experiences for our students. And, um, you know, all of our schools, our traditional schools also understand the importance of collaboration, but sometimes it's a collaboration of a group of adults who come with a plan and then then that work goes out more independently by those teachers to students. This is collaboration to the next degree embedded in every every piece of the practice. So um, people really have to realize there's there's not as much there's very little work you do alone. Everything is done with someone else thinking through, and um, there's a lot of uh, skills that come with collaboration and being able to help people make that shift. The planning then is really connected to that collaboration because um, everything, our students are following an independent learning pathway, but um, there are common things that we have more than one student needing to work on. And so then we kind of pull in pieces where teachers are doing, we, we do workshops where there'll be a, a mini topic where they kind of help do a little bit more guided learning for a set of time. But then those students need to pull that and figure out how to um, take that learning to demonstrate the content in their pathway to connect it to their pathway and keep that going towards their final outcome that they're heading for. Um, the other thing I think that I would share is that in the in the process for planning, um, our students need those super clear outcomes, and we need lots of actionable feedback to help them understand where they're at on their pathway there. But they, what they need also are little micro goals along the way, and those need to be collaboratively developed because that helps them see the success and have that motivation to keep going forward. If we just give them the end learning goal and we just give them, give, keep giving them the feedback, oh, not quite yet try again, that's not as effective, obviously, as the really clear, actionable feedback that you can give with those micro goals about here's the part you got. This is awesome. Here's our here's our not yet that might be the next thing to work on to keep us moving towards that end goal. Yeah, I love that. Um, as far as like the planning, I hope it's okay if I ask a follow up question. I wonder, like, is it total chaos to have everybody working on different goals like that? Like overlapping? I love what I can't believe I can't remember if it was Sarah or Julia said about controlled chaos. <laughs> There's just a certain um, uh, release of that feeling that everyone needs to be focused on the same thing at the same time or because people are working on very different things and they need that space to be able to follow their pathway, which really mimics the real world, um, you know, in, in most business or professional settings, not everybody's working on the same exact thing at the same time because everyone has their different projects that they need to move forward. So I think it's good for our students, but it's a little bit of a shift to, to um, let go of that. Uh, I love what um, Sarah said about unlearning, about some of the experiences we've had uh, previously in our own education that we have to kind of let go of to grasp this model. Absolutely. Um, I want to make sure we get to Julia too. Uh, Julia, I know when we, we we met last week, we were wondering how things were going to go. Um, I know a lot of these programs are on a lottery system. And like for me as a parent, I, I have this internal dialogue going about how I know this type of schooling would have been good for me. It was it would be great for my kids too, um, but I'm also worried that they might leave school not understanding things like deadlines. Um, and I, I'm curious about your approach to this and you know what you think of that internal debate. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, thanks for asking that, especially kind of referring to your own children, because I think as I shared last week, that's my exact experience right now. Um, when we were, when I was, you know, designing and starting to create Gibson Eck, my children were in kindergarten and first grade. So getting to the high school experience seems so far along. And um, a few weeks ago, as we were kind of opening up our application process, 
um, I just kind of all of a sudden freaked out thinking like my um, son is in eighth grade and he can apply to come to Gibson Eck. And it kind of was not really like digging into the conversation with him about what school is, thinking like he knows what our school is about and, you know, um, he can choose if he wants to come here or not. But I freaked out because um, one is having an opportunity for your own child to go to a school like this is a huge um, thing to think about. Our comprehensive high schools and our school district are incredible places. And so he'll have a good experience there. But what I think I see in our students here at Gibson Eck that I desperately want for my own child is one is that students in programs like this are seen and known for their gifts and their talents and their strengths and also their challenges. And that can often be missed in the school system that is very grade based. Um, the other thing that I love that I want for my own children in a school like this is like our kids love learning. It's still school and they have to do work and they have to submit assignments and talk about their learning. But the hook is getting them really excited about the work and helping them understand that that work is connected to things that you're interested in. Um, you're helping to develop these skills that are going to be not only important right now, but for your future and that this learning is connected to your future. Um, and then the last thing that I just see in kids that come to school here is the maturity, the ability to talk with adults and the ability to think about and develop those skills for the future. So you think about like the time management, the organization, the willingness to jump in when they don't know what the answer is and try to figure it out. And those are all things. And most importantly, just making sure our students and our young people are seen for who they are and where they can go and where they can grow um, and not being missed in our other systems is, is important to me. And we had our lottery last week and my son was accepted number 59 out of 60. So there's the big news, thanks. Oh, that's exciting. That's so great. I, um, it is great to get into the school that you really want to get to, what a relieving feeling. Um, we are running out of time and I do want to talk just for a minute about our resources. Um, so we are going to go back to the slides for a second here. Um, I think I'm sharing the screen. Um, we're hoping that folks will take a second and write down some thoughts about how they might use mastery-based learning strategies in their school. Are there highlights of things that you have learned today? And what are the concerns? And what do you want to learn next? Um, if you have some next steps um, in mind, we're also hoping you will take this to the next level by discussing your ideas with the leadership team or your PLC, or even leading a discussion with students and asking what they think about it. Um, here are some resources. Um, we have several to check out. We also have a bunch on our resource sheet that you can look at. Um, I have our pages listed here, as well as some competency-based teaching moves. Um, if you haven't joined the Friends of the MVLC interest group email list, um, it is a awesome resource uh, with new stuff all the time. Um, and the page has an extensive list of stuff you can use to get started as well. Um, our Engage newsletter at OSPI comes out each month. It has articles related to our webinars that you can check out. Um, and so uh, I just want to encourage you to share that with folks who might be interested in these topics related to graduation equity. Uh, next month, uh, we're going to be talking about partnerships to support culturally relevant learning. We'll have our Office of Native Education with us. Uh, it should be a really awesome um, presentation. And while I have here, we are going to put this poll up. Um, we love to get your feedback. Uh, when this webinar closes, a survey will open. It's our feedback survey, and it'll help us understand the things that you're looking for in the webinar and uh, hopefully uh, help us improve. We love continuous improvement, and over the years, this webinar has changed a lot based on your feedback. 
Uh, we'd like to see our listeners get clock hours for joining us. So if you join live, you've already registered for the year through Zoom. You'll also need to register for clock hours monthly in PD Enroller. PD Enroller is going to send an evaluation to your email and will verify your attendance and release your hours. If you watch this video later, the process changes a little bit. Uh, you register each month for clock hours uh, in PD Enroller, and then you complete the evaluation. And you'll also do our graduation equity uh, webinar feedback survey. And that just signals us that you watch the video and we verify your attendance every two weeks. And then we release your clock hours that way. Uh, if you do have questions about this, you can email Ronnie Larson and she does our clock hours support. Thank you everybody for joining us for these webinars. Um, we will see you next month. Have a great day.